Jerry. Good. Thank you, Sherry and Eva and Rob and Cornerstone. And thank you, folks, for your testimonies. Testimonies are always very, very special to me. When I was a lighting design engineer, I had a boss. This was in another life. But I, was, I had a boss who, who always liked to say, I like for my people to stand on their hind legs and say what's on their mind. Well, I think we serve a Lord who really appreciates people who will stand up and say what's on their hearts. And I, I appreciate those testimonies very, very, very much. And I'm grateful for tonight. I'm always thrilled on Sunday evening to come and see you here and realize you could be doing a lot of other things, including nothing. And I appreciate so very much your being here. Would you take your copy of God's Word, please, and turn to John chapter 17. We'll back up a couple of verses and begin reading in the last verses of chapter 16. I talked this morning about the fact that if you're going to be spiritually nourished, sometimes you just have to feed yourself. Uh, you, you can't just take it for granted that somebody's going to spoon feed you all the spiritual food that you need. This is a section of Scripture that if you're going to begin to get all the blessings and the power from this that you should, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with it. Take it to your quiet time uh, take it with yourself privately somewhere and just read it and read it and read it. This is that wonderful long prayer of our Lord Christ, and we're going to be looking at it for several weeks now. But let's begin in verse 31. An interesting thing has happened. You know, this, this is a night of great tension. This is that night that Christ was arrested. This is the night before the crucifixion. This is when all these strange things are being said to the people about from Christ about what's going to happen and what's going on, and they didn't understand. And finally, they began to make the noises that helped the Lord know that they did understand and they did believe on Him as He really is. So He says in verse 31, You believe at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know everything that you have given me comes from you. For now I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer but they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one even as we are one. And then in verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Can you imagine a meeting of the world leaders tonight? all the presidents and potentates, the rulers of all the kingdoms and all the nations and all the governments of this world are together. And suppose one begins to read 
from the dais saying this is on our agenda tonight the people of the first baptist church in jackson mississippi are having sunday evening service and we're very concerned that those people get everything that god has for them there and so let's pray and let's find out and let's have a conference and talk about how in the world we can help that to happen and all that's going on in this world when you think of all the powers of this world the concerns of this world do you think that's possible in the real corridor of power our god is very concerned about what's going on in your heart tonight and he's very concerned about what takes place in this meeting this evening and he has something very much in mind that he wants to say to you and to bless you with and to help you with god is concerned about you and you need to know that in this prayer this prayer reflects the heart of god the bible says that jesus is sitting at the right hand of god making intercession for you and me right now just as he prayed for those apostles just as he prayed in verse 20 for us he said i pray not just for these apostles but for those who will believe because of their message that's you and me our lord is still praying for us and so we get a glimpse here of what it means to see the lord jesus pray to know what he's like to feel a little bit more of his heart and to understand how we can be like him a little bit more he prayed this high priestly prayer some have called it you know what the high priestly prayer was once a year the chief priest would go into the holy of holies and there he would make sacrifice and pray on behalf of the people and here the word is saying that jesus christ daily in the holy of holies and this time this evening he went into the holy of holies and he made prayer earnest prayer for his people for those disciples who were with him he prayed and also he prayed for you and me who will believe because who have believed because of their ministry and because of their work it is christ praying to his father praying first about himself that he may bring glory to the father praying about his people with him kept saying things like them and they and they and yours and i have been with them and you have given them me and they are yours he's praying very personally and specifically for these people in verse 9 he says openly i pray for them and then in verse 20 he says i pray for all who will believe because of their witness he said i am praying he's praying for us now tonight the verses we'll look at will tell us something about the personal jesus and something about the passion of jesus for his people i think we must keep in mind constantly when this prayer was prayed this is just on the eve of his crucifixion within a few hours he's going to be arrested and all of that rough stuff that takes place around the gruesome pageantry of the cross is about to begin and yet jesus takes time to pray like this and to pray to his father and to pray to you and me and he begins by saying father every prayer begins like that doesn't it father he said i pray to you father in verse 5 and now father in verse 11 holy father this is the only time in all the scripture that jesus addresses his father as the holy father in verse 20 he says father just as you're in me and i am in you in verse 24 father i want to give those you have given me to be with me where i am righteous father in verse 25 though the world does not know you i know you jesus had this father son relationship with the lord god and when he prayed father it's a little different than when you and i pray father but it shouldn't be as we grow more and more attuned and in love with our father just like the lord jesus christ a father-son relationship i'm at that point where my children are not children anymore my baby is 35 years old and my son is 38 but they still we still have a kind of a father-child relationship and i cherish that i like that they call me pretty often and talk to me and say dad it's the same name they call me all their life and there's a certain way that they say dad that makes me know they're going to ask me for things like they've asked me for things all my life and i like it i really do cherish that relationship it's a it's a wonderful wonderful thing i was thinking about the cards that i've gotten through the years on father's day uh, father's day means a lot more to me than i act like it does it does to all of us 
But I remember some cards I've gotten. I remember one card I got from my son one year. He said, Dad, you really are tough. You can take a, large, a lot of hard knocks. I know that's why you have me. Love, son. My, uh, my daughter sent a card once saying, Dad, this Father's Day, you can do anything you want to do. It's your day. You're the head of the house just so long as you ask Mom first. <laughs> then there was that card from wife to husband. And she said, I usually don't send you a, a Father's Day card, but I wanted to honor you on this day. And I wanted to give you a compliment. You have a lovely wife. <laughs> well, here Jesus and, and, and his father had this relationship. You, you, you read this and read it and read it, and they're talking to each other. They're talking lovingly to each other. Uh, Jesus is saying the things that are deeply on his heart, and prayer is not a bunch of cliches, not a bunch of worn-out words that have been used over and over and over until they don't mean anything anymore, but they're words of personal love and commitment and guidance and direction and help and hope and, and praying about the very deep things of his life. He's, he's, he's talking to his, to his father. It's a relationship that is an interesting relationship. When we know how much God loved his son, and yet when we see what he let his son go through for us, then that begins to tell us something about how much God loves us and how important he is to us. Now, in, in Europe this summer, I was, I was with an English preacher who spent more time trying to let, get me to say awe than, and, and say, well, he used the word dance of all words. Well, he, he said, you're supposed to say dance. And I, and I said to him, why can't an A sound like an A? Why does it have to sound like a visit to the doctor's office? You know, ah, ah, ah. It, does, it doesn't have to do that. But he was, he was telling about reading a story. Now, you know about the English tabloids, and they're kind of like the National Enquirer, so I don't know about the validity of this story. But he was saying that, that Michael Jackson's uh, little boy lives this kind of life, the baby. At that time, he was telling us the baby was a year old. And, uh, and he was saying that from the time the baby was three weeks old, that he had people that worked him out every day, that worked him out physically and worked on his muscles and tried to build his muscles and make him a stronger little baby, that he had eight full-time people who looked after that little baby. There were six nannies and six nurses, and always a nanny and a nurse in the room in shifts all day long. The air was completely decontaminated. Every time the child touched a toy, it was thrown away because it, it might be contaminated. No one was allowed to pick the child up and hug it and kiss it and hold it. No one was allowed to touch that child unless they have uh, a reason to do so and, and some kind of work to do. Uh, all day long, they did the exercises. They, they did other things. All night long, people were there to read and sing to the baby. And when Michael Jackson was not there, they played his records so the baby could hear it. And I thought, what a relationship. He doesn't even want his child to see a germ. And here was God, the most fabulously wealthy and famous father in all the world. And his son was born in a cattle shed, uh, not a very hygienic place. And he, uh, he went through all this agony. There was an attempt on his life when he was a baby. He had to run for his life and flee like a refugee into Egypt. Then he came back to Nazareth and grew up there in a very poor home. And he went through a very difficult life, and he died a very difficult death. And, and all of this, their, their relationship in that was so wonderful. The relationship of Jesus and his father was such a fantastic thing. We see it all the way through the Scripture, how much he prayed and how he spent that quiet, private time with his father, how he, he prayed. And when he taught others to pray, he would always teach them to say, Father, Daddy, I love you. Your name is the most important name in all the world to me. He had such a great relationship, even though the life was tough. And this tells us something that really is behind what Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Would you think about how much God loves you and how that's shown and what he let them do to his son because he loves you.
because he cares. And Jesus was showing that wonderful relationship with the Father, uh, working that out, and uh, this, this, this relationship, as you read through the New Testament, this relationship got Jesus into most of the trouble. When was it that they took up stones to stone him? When they picked up rocks and they were going to throw rocks at him and kill him? It was when he said, I and the Father are one. The works I do are the works of the Father. The things I say are the words of the Father. The miracles I do are what the Father is doing. The love I have in my heart for you is the love of the Father's heart for you. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Every time he said that, they tried to kill him. And yet this relationship was so important to him, and it was his greatest testimony. He kept sharing it over and over again. We see something about the personal Jesus and his relationship with God as we look at this prayer. And then we've got to say we see something in the passion of Jesus. What would Jesus pray for his people? If our Lord were to come tonight and to address you and to tell you what he wanted you to do and what he wanted you to be and how he wanted us to act in our world as followers of his and Christians of his, what would he say? Well, this night he's praying something very, very specific. And he prays it constantly. And he prays it repeatedly. He's praying that all of his people may be one. And you notice the thing that sort of prompted this prayer? Jesus didn't pray much in public. You've noticed that. He always went aside to pray. He went out in the woods to pray. He spent the night privately in prayer. When he taught about prayer, he said, your best praying is not going to be when you're trying to impress people with how you can pray. Your best praying is going to be when you get into that closet, that private place with God, and God who sees in secret will reward you openly. That's when you will pray powerfully. And yet here he is with these men. And in verse 31, he said, you believe at last, but a time has come when you will be scattered. And he got to thinking about that scattering, about the time that was coming. Now, the women were brave. Women are usually more brave than men. And the women were brave, and they came to the cross, and they were there, and they suffered through that with Christ, and they watched that, and they handled that. But only John among all the men was there. They were scattered. And after Christ was resurrected and they began to persecute the church, the white Bible says it was scattered to the ends of the earth. And our Lord was concerned about that scattering. And he was concerned about them being scattered and being driven in every kind of direction. And so he prayed one constant thing. He prayed that they may be one. Lord, he said, keep them one. Father, in verse 11, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. What a great number is one. Lord, keep them one. Keep them in unity. We find that over and over again in this prayer. Lord, make your people one. And yet you and I are Baptist. <laughs> and we're independent people. We're independent by nature. That's the nature of being a Baptist, I guess. Somebody said you put three Baptists in a room, you're going to have four definite opinions. And we have trouble being one. It's one of our difficulties that we are one with, with all Christians, that we, that we be one. Uh, the Lord tells us that he wants us to be one, and we're, we have problems with that. There's an Anglican priest who has been reading Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh. He, he's a very deep intellectual man. And he has decided that in the animals in, in Winnie the Pooh and his friends that we find all the denominations, or at least many of them, represented. He has decided that Tigger is a Pentecostal because he's always bouncing around, always saying, walla, 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 walla. He's always doing that, that he must be a Pentecostal. He's saying that kangaroo, with her baby in her pouch, that the kangaroo must be Roman Catholic because he's always trying to be mother to everybody and, and to be the mother there. He was saying that the owl, the wise old owl, is a reformed Presbyterian, don't you know? Uh, real informed and very intellectual, and that's the wise old owl. And he says that the piglet must be a Methodist because the piglet is so enthusiastic and bouncy and everything is always every day and every way. Things are getting better and better like Norman Vincent Peale. 
uh, the pig that must be a Methodist, but he said, rabbit is definitely a Baptist. He said, the thing that makes us know that rabbit is a Baptist is because he's, he's always making resolutions. And those resolutions are always signed by rabbit. And rabbit is the most organized animal of all of them, so he must be a Baptist. He must be a Baptist. He's always, in, always concerned about water and with washing himself, and so he, he says he must be a Baptist. But the thing he said that cinched it all, make us know that, that rabbit is a Baptist because there are so many of the rabbits, and rabbit has all this relationship with so many relatives, and they all are different. They're all subdivided. They're all in one little group or one little clan or another group over here and another group over here who believe just a little bit different. He said this is definitely the reason that rabbit is a Baptist because of all of those subdivisions. And it's been kind of true, hasn't it, in our history? Somebody starts a Baptist church and then some of them break off, go down the road a few miles and start a, a Bible Baptist church. And then some of them break off, go down the mile, road a few miles and start a Bible-believing Baptist church. And then some of them will break off and they'll start the greater Bible-believing Baptist church. And, and on you go, each one trying to subdivide and subdivide because we get so caught up in some things that are not the vital things. Now, I am as conservative as anybody you know when it comes to this Word, that this is the Word of God. I believe with all my soul that this is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. I am an inerrantist. And because I do believe this is the Word of God is the reason I wouldn't be involved in the controversy we had about this Bible being the Word of God because I don't think that's what it was about. I think it was about power. I don't think it was about the Bible at all. If it was, it's strange because people are violating so many things in the Bible trying to defend the Bible, which doesn't seem very logical to me. Back in the 1920s, my father denied his faith because of a controversy like that where Baptists were dividing. And in my little hometown... There are two Baptist churches. There's the First Baptist Church, which is Southern Baptist, and there is the Independent Church. And on its sign, it says, Independent, Fundamental, Premillennial, Dispensational, and you better be all four of those and prove it, or you're not going to be welcome there. And each church seemed to be able to tell what was wrong with the other. That seemed to be the real reason for them to exist. And I think our Lord's heart was broken because his concern is that we be one, that, that there is one Lord and one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is Lord of all and in us all. There's one spirit that leads us all. In the, in the mathematics of God, it's very easy. The great number is one. The three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one. And Christ prays here, Lord, make your people one. He wants that so very, very badly. During the midst of our controversy, I remember someone called me and said, why don't you get in the game? I would not join either one of the groups that were forming at that time. And, and I said, look, friend, I think I am in the game. I believe the game that God has given us is to preach his word, to love his word, to grow people to love his word and to love his church, to win as many people as we can to Christ, to be involved in missions and sharing Jesus Christ around the world. I believe that is the game, and I believe this thing that's going on here is the fight that's going on under the stands. And I don't know what to do about it but I don't want to be a part of it. And I think it's, it's, it's our Lord's mind that directs us like that because his great prayer is, Lord, make your people one. Divisiveness is such a, a tragic, tragic thing. And one thing that we should work on, according to the Word of God, is that we should be one and that all of God's people could be one. For it says, by that people shall know that you are my disciples. That'll be your greatest witness, that you're one, that you love one another that you're caring about one another. In Ephesians 4, where it talks about the oneness of God, it also talks about what those one people in God are like. It says they will be humble. They will be very, very humble. It says they will be gentle. They will have patience with each other. They will forbear in love for one another. And there's one thing I can certainly say to you, that if you want to have a bad relationship with somebody, then be proud. Be proud. If you want to have a bad relationship with somebody, don't be gentle. Be abrasive. Be assertive in such a way that you, that you attack anyone who doesn't agree with every jot and tittle with you. If you want to break a, a time with somebody, be impatient with them. Just don't have any patience with them at all. 
and don't love them. And if you don't have humility, if you don't have forbearance in love, if you don't have gentleness and patience, then you'll spoil the relationship. And our Lord says, I want you to have the relationship of being one. One of the things that God sent me on in mission journey along this line is to go into the inner city of, of San Antonio and to be pastor there of the, of the inner city First Baptist Church for several years, just two and a half years, really. It was an interesting time, in many ways a very difficult time, in many ways one of the most rewarding times, but it was a time when the Spirit of God was upon a church like I had never seen before. We baptized 1,750 people in two and a half years. Every Sunday night, we baptized 25 people. And I've often thought about how that could be and how that could happen. I sat and watched it happen and couldn't find any reason for it to happen except God was doing it. Well, we went to where the people were. We went to the Air Force Base where all the 19-year-old recruits in the country were sent to, to train for the Air Force when they volunteered and preached to 2,500 of them every Sunday afternoon. And many of them were saved and we brought them to our church. Many of them I met who had, li who had lived in Mississippi and had heard our services on television years and years before and had never made a profession of faith and came because the seed was planted first of all from here. And then they came to join the Air Force when they got older. I just uh, don't know why God let us reach all those people except there was one thing unique about that church. Everybody was important. Half of the people we baptized in that 2,500 were not white. They were from all over the world. They were from the African-American community. They were from the Hispanic community. We spoke seven languages in that church. Every Sunday morning, we had to have seven different places where people could hear the gospel in their own language. But I do remember that when everybody began to come together and we had little radios that had different languages in them and, and we, we could all meet together in the, in the big sanctuary they had there, I remember one of the things we did at the close of the service was that people would hold each other's hands like we do. And, and then as we would sing our closing hymn, like, like the wonderful song that, that we have, that we sing so very often, Because He Lives, their song was, Lord, Make Your People One. And they would sing the song, Lord, Make Your People One. Finish, oh, finish the work begun. Lord, Make Your People One. And when they'd come to that course, they'd all hold each other's hands up. And notice that some of those hands would be dirty, but it didn't matter. Some of them were black and brown and yellow and white. It didn't matter. And they were singing and praying it with all their souls. Lord, make your people one. Finish, oh, finish the work begun. Lord, make your people one. I wish you would spend time with our Lord's Prayer. I wish you would read it over and over and over again until the passion of Jesus Christ becomes the passion of your heart. Lord, make your people one. And when that happens, I believe we'll begin to see the revival that we've yearned for so very, very much. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for loving us, for caring about us, for being our God. Thank you that we can call you Father because Jesus showed us the relationship that we should be able to have with you. And Lord, I pray you'll make us one. Make us one people. Make us love you with all of our hearts and souls. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you come and let us know you've received Christ as Savior? I, I did that. When I was 10 years old, I walked down the aisle scared to death. And the people were so glad that I came, and I was glad I came too because it began a wonderful life for me. Maybe this is your night to share the fact you've received Christ as Savior. Perhaps there are those who need to move their membership and join our church, and we'd love to have you do that. This is such an informal and good setting on Sunday night. This is a good time to do it and to come and let us welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Maybe there's a time for rededication. Maybe you want to come to the altar and kneel. And, and ask God to work in your heart and in your life. I don't know what God's doing in your heart, but I know he's doing something. I feel that very strongly, and I pray you'll respond to that and not struggle against it. Come and do that thing that honors him now. Let's stand, and you come and do God's will.